This is Maddie Zhu in the Botanical Garden Center for Conservation and Research at the Bay Wildlife, which I'll short the crew from here on out. I'm going to tell you about some of the research that we're doing to help conserve endangered wine So, um, just to start out, ex situ conservation is usually thought of as a complement to in situ conservation, or maybe even like secondary to in situ conservation. But with increasing, increasing threats to plant biodiversity, like climate change, conservation is becoming more and more important. It's really important for us to get those plants somewhere where they're safe in case we can't keep up with those threats. And so normally what we're talking about when we're talking about ex situ conservation is conventional seed making. And that is the easiest way for us to collect a large amount of genetic diversity for a small amount of money and a small amount of space. However, what we're really interested at at CREW are exceptional species, which are these species which by definition cannot be seed bank. So a plant can be exceptional for a number of reasons. Number one, they could be sensitive, uh, seeds could be sensitive to drying or freezing, which would prevent them from surviving the conventional seed banking process. The one I'm kind of really scared about is the short lifespan and storage, so they seem like they're actually surviving um, conventional seed banking, but when we take them out five, 10, 20 years in the future, the viability just drops off of the cliff. And we're finding that more and more as time goes on, more and more species. And finally, there's some plants that just don't produce seeds, or produce very, very few seeds. And this can be either due to natural factors or to things like pollinator loss or very low population size. So we're particularly interested right now in exceptional species in Hawaii, thanks to an Institute of Museum and Library Services grant that we re recently received. And exceptional species in Hawaii are of particular importance because Hawaii has really high endemism rates, like 90%, 30% of native Hawaiian taxa are listed, and then on top of that, up to 30% of native Hawaiian seed plants may be producing non-orthodox seeds and may be these alternative technologies for ex situ collection. So how are we protecting these exceptional Hawaiian plant species? We're partnering with the Lion Arboretum Micropropagation Lab, which is run primarily by Nelly Suji, and this is an amazing lab where they have over 300 species of Hawaiian flora and tissue culture. They're actively maintaining them, and those are made available for uh, people to use in restorations around Hawaii. And what we're bringing to the table at CREW is our cryo expertise and our cryo bio bank. So we have a liquid nitrogen bank that we've maintained since the 90s, we have over 250 species of plants in cryopreservation. So we're partnering with the Lion Arboretum so that we can help develop protocols and bank their plant species that they already have in tissue culture. So I'm just gonna run you through cryopreservation because I think this is a crowd that may not be familiar with it. Um, so I'm gonna use a couple of iconic plant species maybe to show you how we do cryopreservation of these plants. And I'm going to start out with Melicopia mucronulata. This is a plant that's known from like four plants in the wild right now. So like super, super low, critically endangered, super low population size. And it's producing few to no seeds, so it's maintained in micropropagation. So I'm going to show you how we do our standard cryopreservation procedure, which for these plants is shoot tip drop vitrification. And we're first going to start out with tissue production, so you have to actually produce quite a bit of tissue in order to do these processes. And we do that using in vitro techniques because it's the fastest and easiest way for us to produce a large amount of clonal tissue, which we can use for tissue isolation. So you can see here we're in shoot tip cryopreservation, isolating the shoot tips. We can either isolate the shoot apical meristems here in purple, or we can take any of the number of axillary buds off the sides of the stem as well. We'll isolate these very carefully under a microscope and do about one millimeter portions of tissue where we really just want that top cap of uh, meristematic tissue. So you've actually isolated those. We'll put them through a series of cryoprotectants where we're just trying to like jam pack those cells full of sucrose and other cryoprotectants so that they don't actually produce ice crystals when they freeze, which is what's going to kill the plant in freezing. So um, when we cryopreserve them, we just put typically groups of 10 shoot tips into a single droplet of vitrification solution on a sterile piece of filter, uh, filter, foil, aluminum foil, and then we'll put those into our cryobiotic. Um, 
We'll also take a subset of, of tissues, typically tissue tips, from short-term storage, which is one hour of li liquid nitrogen exposure, and also from vitrification solutions, so before they've actually experienced any freezing whatsoever, just to assess their survival before they go into the bank long-term. Now, whenever we remove plants from liquid nitrogen, we're going to quickly thaw them in a rinsing solution and then plate those individual shoot tips onto a recovery medium and assess them sur for survival two weeks after liquid nitrogen removal. Um, and these are just melancopy that have been growing for about a month after liquid nitrogen exposure. They're happy and great. And in this species, we've seen up to 57% survival after liquid nitrogen exposure. We're trying to hit a threshold of 40% survival, and that sounds kind of low, but remember that these are clonal shoot tips. So for one genotype, even if we have one shoot tip survive, technically that genotype has survived liquid nitrogen. Okay. So what I'm really interested in now is how do we simplify this process and make it a little easier so that other labs around the country and around the globe can start using these techniques. And for that, I'm going to tell you about Sertandra gracilis, also known as Haiwale. This one's known from a slightly larger uh, number of plates, six to eight individuals um, in the Hawaiian Islands, and there's only one occurrence on Oahu. And again, it's producing few to no seeds. Now, the thing to note about this plant is that it's a gizmarian, so it's related to African violets. So I first started out with our standard shoot tip um, cryopreservation, and I got zero percent survival after liquid nitrogen. But we started looking into the literature, especially at other African violet species, and we saw that they're capable of direct shoot organogenesis, which is this weird thing where if you put a somatic tissue like a leaf and treat it with hormones, you can get it to start producing tons and tons of these little shoots of buds on that somatic tissue. So I was able to take those, just chop them up into little pieces and cryopreserve them, and they survived great. So I started getting interested in, okay, how do we standardize this for this species, maybe others, and I was really interested in two things. One, the developmental stage. So here in the red, you can kind of see it. Those little buds are starting to develop, but they haven't really developed a distinct morphology yet. And in blue, you can see actual distinct shoots. So I want to compare how they survive liquid nitrogen. And my biggest goal was to see if I could really make that shoot tip or that uh, tissue isolation even easier by hole punching them. So I did these giant five millimeter discs that I just hole punched out of those leaves. And I compared them to the smaller, but still easier than shoot tip isolation, um, one millimeter chunks of tissue. And doing that, we saw that in the good news, those developed shoots survived really well, but in the bad news, my large uh, discs did not survive. So we still have to do a pretty small amount of tissue, but we're seeing um, up to 60% survival of this tissue type after liquid nitrogen exposure. Okay. So that made my life a little easier because I have to get under the microscope and really carefully extract all these shoe tips. But what about other types of plants that are, it's difficult to even find that shoe tip whatsoever. So I'm talking about things like monocots and ferns, things where you don't really have these nice axillary buds that you can just be pulling off the shoes. So we're looking here at Esplegium peruvianum. This is an endangered Hawaiian fern again. And ferns are difficult because it's just hard to find that shoot tip and extract it out. But we knew from other fern species that they're capable of doing this kind of strange thing called the production of green globular bodies. And these are basically just kind of clumps of tissue that will grow and proliferate, and they have multiple meristematic regions like within that tissue. It's very strange. But we got them to produce on our <laughs> various types of hormone media, and then I got them to revert back to normal plant growth on a different type of hormone media. I thought, great, this is really hard to these. So I ended up just deciding to take our little green globular bodies, and you can just grab them with a pair of tweezers, no dissecting involved whatsoever, and I put them through the entire process of cryopreservation, just like I would with the shoe tip, and we had up to 90% survival after liquid nitrogen exposure. So, what are my conclusions here? Number one, cryopreservation is working as a method of conservation for these species. So this is how we're keeping these plants in ex situ collections, and it seems to be working. 
However, these protocols are still having to be tweaked, definitely at the species level, and usually even within a species, at the genotype level too. So sometimes we'll see differential responses to liquid nitrogen exposure, even within genotypes in the species. But with a focus on simplification, we can make it easier for labs around the country, and ideally around the globe, to start developing their own cryopreservation protocols. And moving forward, I just wanted to draw attention to the fact that exceptional species do need more attention. A lot of times when people find an exceptional species or are working with one, they kind of tend to get shoved by the wayside because they're perceived as difficult to work with. I don't know what to do with these. They're not producing seeds. The seeds die really easily. We can't keep them in ex situ collections. And that's been fine up to a point, and we have a lot of plants in ex situ banks now, but now all of these exceptional species are starting to isolate out where we don't really have them protected the same way. We have conventional species protect protected, but we just want to say that cryopreservation works, and we can simplify these methods and get more people on board. We can actually start to keep these plants protected. Um, and so with that, I definitely want to acknowledge our collaborators at the Lion Arboretum, um, Dr. Teresa Polly, who is working on this project with us as well, and all of the staff and interns at Crew who have helped us. And um, this is my email. <laughs> if anybody here, I think I've heard some today, is working with a potentially exceptional species and you want to like talk shop about how to get that in ex situ collections, just like find me or email me or something. <laughs> uh, and with that, I can take any questions.